Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a wonderful introduction by my dear friend Eugene Gluck. And a thank you for all that you have done to champion that L. And really, all you've done to champion the state of Israel and its absolute right to exist and its right to exist as a secure, free, and unfettered nation. And we're here tonight not only to celebrate the extraordinary accomplishments of this community, but to recognize that it would not have happened without the sacrificial leadership of people like you, Jin. And I'm going to say thank you for giving me the privilege of being on the same stage with you. What an honor. Now, the buildup that he gave was quite significant, saying that several people have come here and ended up being prime minister. There are times when I'm not but sure that maybe I'd have better luck becoming prime minister of Israel than I would <laughs> being president, but that remains to be seen. I've been to Israel three times this year alone. I took my group that I take almost every year, this time 300 Americans, most of whom had never been. We went in February, saw the country pretty much from Dan to Beersheba. And then in June, I went with Dr. Frager and a group from the US, and it just so happened that it was almost immediately after the horrific kidnapping of the three young Jewish students, one of whom was in fact an American citizen. And as soon as I landed at the airport, I went directly to the home of Naftali Frankel and visited with his parents. And I saw the most remarkable courage in the parents of Naftali Frankel. And as his mother, Rachel, a beautiful young Jewish mother who teaches theology in a nearby yeshiva, as I realized what an extraordinary family this was, I was struck by the fact that there was very little being said from the US government as to the fact that one of our citizens had been kidnapped by terrorists. And I'm thinking, why isn't there a bold and loud protest and outrage coming? from the United States government. And then I realized that because our government has been too busy expressing loudly and boldly its outrage over bedrooms being built in Israel by Israelis for the people who own the land according to God's deed from the Bible. And I recognized that there were some people in the American government who were angry over the wrong thing. If anything, our government should be encouraging Israel to build as many bedrooms as can be in Samaria, Judea, and throughout the land of Israel, and especially in the capital of Israel in Jerusalem. Our government has acted as if it is outraged. Well, tonight, let me say to you, I am outraged. I am outraged that Israel has been given a sense of moral equivocation with the likes of the terrorists of Hamas. And when Hamas was sending rockets by the thousands indiscriminately into civilian targets in Israel, there were people in the American government who'd had the audacity to suggest that maybe there wouldn't be rocket launches if Israel would just abdicate its sovereign right to the land that God gave them. And maybe it was their fault, at least in some way. That same idiocy prevailed a few weeks ago when people were slaughtered at their prayer time in a synagogue. It is bad enough to just 
target civilians indiscriminately. It is even more morally unacceptable to target civilians when they go into a house of God to worship and to pray and to intentionally seek to slaughter them and mutilate them in a holy place. And we allowed to have the president of the Palestinian Authority express at first in his first sentence his condemnation of the killings but then unfortunately a lot of American media didn't carry the second sentence which implicated Israel as having been partly responsible because they had not just simply walked away from their own land and given that land over to people who had never come to the peace table, had never ever even acknowledged Israel's right to exist. There is no moral equivalency between terrorism and the free state of the nation of Israel. One is evil and one is good. One represents civilization and the other represents barbarism. One cannot say that there is some kind of equality. When I take people to Israel, I always go by and get a map from some of the Palestinian shops. And I open it up and I say, show me Israel on this map. They can't do it because it's not there. And I say, why is it not there? And they look confused. And I say because the Palestinians have refused to acknowledge the existence of Israel and continue to teach in their schools to their children that the Jews are targets for murder. This should be so unacceptable that the United States should send a simple message that until the Palestinians are willing to acknowledge not only the right of Israel to exist, but until it tears every page of every textbook that has that kind of anti-Semitic, hateful, unacceptable, violent language within the textbooks for children, not only will the United States not support any type of negotiation, for there is nothing to negotiate, but the United States will cease immediately to send another dime of support to the PA and another dime of support to Gaza. And the money that would have been given will now go to send concrete to Israel so they can build the foundations for new apartment buildings and new neighborhoods throughout Judea and Samaria and make sure that the world understands that the boundaries of Israel will not be determined by the United, Station, United Nations because they were already determined by God Almighty about 3,000 years ago. My wife and I went back to Israel at the end of August, just as the, the war with Gaza was coming to a conclusion. I wanted to go and show the people of Israel that those of us from America, those of us who aren't even Jewish, stand with them. And that no matter what kind of insanity they may hear coming out of the American media, that there was still strong support for the people of Israel who understood the difference between putting their soldiers in front of their citizens and putting their citizens in front of their soldiers. We understand the difference. I don't think a lot of my fellow Americans fully understand and comprehend the reason that our friendship with Israel is not a mere convenience. It is a moral obligation. And the reason it is a moral obligation is the same reason that there was in the scripture those words that say that there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We should recognize that the United States is to Israel what Jonathan was to David. And that there should be a relationship that is inseparable there should be a relationship that the entire world understands, goes far beyond the geopolitical concerns that we might share. 
It goes to the very heart of the fact of our respect for the human dignity and the value of every life and our recognition that what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust is a horror that never should have happened and we pledge with Israel will never ever happen again. And if it takes every last American ounce of energy, we will not stand by and allow something like that to happen again. Twice this year, I've been to Auschwitz and Birkenau. Once was in January, when the majority of the Israeli government flew to have a historic meeting. And it was not lost on me as I stood there on an incredibly cold day in which the temperature was in the teens with about a 20 mile an hour wind. I stood there with a heavy coat and with gloves and a scarf and I was still just uncomfortably cold out on the grounds of Birkenau. And I got to thinking of the fact that while I stood there with some of the greatest and latest technology to keep me warm, that many years before me, my Jewish brothers and sisters stood there with those same temperatures in nothing but the thinnest of pajamas supplied by the Nazis who were working them to death and underfeeding them and trying to kill every last one of them. And it was a cold day in more ways than one, but there was one great moment when I realized that every attempt to end Jewish life on this planet, and of course preclude the thought that there would ever be a Jewish state of Israel, had not only miserably failed, but that here, some 70 years later, came a government of the very people that were never supposed to survive the walls of this facility. And maybe they had left the few who survived, barely alive from the ordeal and the torture. But their descendants came back with strength, with honor, with dignity, and with victory. Because what happened to the Jewish people in the rebirth and in the founding of the nation of Israel was not simply a political movement that had its ultimate culmination in the foundation of a nation. It was an act of Almighty God that no one can deny happened only because God's hand reached out and says, His covenant has not yet been fulfilled or completed, but when God makes a covenant, He keeps His covenant, and the establishment and success and the thriving nature of Israel today is nothing less than the testament of God having kept his promise. And that's why the United States would be well to remember that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. It was true in the time of David. And it is true in the time of the United States in the year 2014. If you wonder why I am here saying these things, not even being Jewish, I may be the only Baptist in the room. <laughs> I do what I do best. I come, I eat, I speak, they won't let me take an offering, or I would do that as well. <laughs> but I tell you that I'm convinced that the United States of America is a country that can only be explained by the providence of God. There is no other explanation for this nation any more than there's any other explanation for the land of Israel. And when I say that there is a unique bond between the nations of the United States and Israel, it is not geopolitical, it is spiritual, it is biblical. And if we ever believe it is something other than that, especially those of us here in this country, may God help us, and I'm not sure at that point he will. 
It is so very important that we let the world know that our partnership, our relationship with Israel will not be changed nor forsaken. It might be temporarily impeded by those who do not fully comprehend and understand the moral obligation we have. But I also believe with all that is within me that that which temporarily may take this country's alliances to the brink of brokenness is a country that has shown again and again its remarkable resilience and will once again rise to stand with Israel shoulder to shoulder and say to the world, you touch a hair on their heads and you have touched our head. And if they raise their hand to defend themselves, we will raise our hand to stand with them. We are inseparable in our freedom, in our commitment to the democracy of the people, and you will not be able to raise your hand or your nuclear weapon against them, and to attempt to do so will result in your annihilation, not in theirs. That is the message the United States need to clearly send to the people of the world. Just three weeks ago, I took 100 people on a visit to three areas. We went first to Krakow, Poland, then to London, England, and ended up at the Reagan Library in California. And as I accompanied 100 leaders to these places, it was to follow the extraordinary influence of Pope John Paul II, Margaret Thatcher, and Ronald Reagan. Three people that the world didn't have a lot of use for, and didn't think too much of. In each of their countries, they were greatly underestimated. Most people did not believe they were up to the task to which they ascended. In each of their countries, they brought a real sense of clarity, not only to the economics of their positions, but each of them brought spiritual clarity and believed that their purposes were higher than themselves and were in fact missions that were delivered by God himself. And the result of the confluence of these three extraordinary individuals was that within 10 years of their ascent to power individually on their three separate continents, it was that communism fell, first in Eastern Europe and ultimately in the Soviet Union itself, and that freedom rang out. But as part of our trip to Poland, when we went to Auschwitz, and I told the group there, I said, this for me is the third time I've been here. For most of you, it is your first. I said, I cannot fully prepare you for what you're going to see. And I certainly cannot prepare you for what you're going to feel. But you do not come in here today as a tourist. And I pray to God you do not leave here having believed that you visited a site but rather that you were able to give witness and testimony to one of the greatest horrors of human history. And that it will so shake you to your roots to realize that what happened here in this place happened, happened at the hands of a government that represented the most educated, scientifically advanced, technology-oriented, and even theologically advanced nation on the earth at the time. And you'll wonder how it was possible that Nazi soldiers could go to work every day knowing that the work, their job, their assignment each day was to see how many Jews they could kill and they would kill as many Jews, thousands a day, and then leave their killing factory, go home to their families, have dinner, read stories to their children, go to bed, get up the next day, and do the same thing over again. How could something so horrible ever happen at the hands of people who had any semblance of sanity? And I said, the true answer is you will never be able to figure it out, except that it can only be explained by one word, evil. And now I tell you 
that there is only one word to describe what motivates people to cut off the heads of children and put those heads on a stake outside a city gate in the Kurdish territory of Iraq or in the countryside of Syria. And there is only one word to explain why people would joyfully dance in the streets at the news of the murder of people at prayer. And there is only one word to describe why people would delight in the idea that innocents were being killed indiscriminately by rockets shot into the air with the sole hope not to take out a military target but to take out a synagogue or a school or a store. And that word is evil. And my prayer is that those of us here in the United States and our partners in Israel will never be reticent and never ever be fearful in using the word that is the only word to describe the battle that we face across the globe today. It is not a battle between good ideas and better ideas. It is not a battle between people with a different point of view or people who want the same piece of real estate. It is a battle between good and evil, God and all the forces who rise up against him. And that's why the clarity of the battle must continue to be announced by not only those of you in this room, but by our partners in Israel. And the reason that this dinner is so important and that the people who come here who contribute generously to make sure that communities continue to grow, survive, and thrive in Israel is because the greatest way to put down evil is to raise up good. The greatest way to snuff out darkness is to light more lights. And tonight, the darkness is being snuffed out because of the lights that are being illuminated by those of you in this room whose generosity means that little children will grow up in a free Israel, in a state where they can worship and where they can be safe and secure, and where the United States will say, we don't just stand behind you, we stand with you, shoulder to shoulder, now and forevermore. Thank you, and God bless.